Professor Vinay Kumar Srivastav, Director, Anthropological Survey of India, Shri P. K. Mukhopadhyay, Deputy Director General, GSI Faridabad, Shri M. Chandra Das, DDG DGCO, Directors, Senior Officers, and my esteemed colleagues. Today we have assembled here to enlighten ourselves with the immense knowledge of Professor V. K. Srivastav, who will be delivering a talk on Tribes of India perspective in context of GSI and exploration. This event is being conducted under the edges of Regional Training Institute, GSI NR Lucknow, who has actualized the concept of this lecture. Uh, first of all, I would like to request all of you to put your mobile phones in silent mode or turn it off. Thank you. सर्वप्रथम मैं उप महानिदेशक महोदय से निवेदन करना चाहूंगी कि वे बुके देकर हमारे मुख्य अतिथि प्रोफेसर वीके श्रीवास्तव जी का स्वागत करें अब मैं श्री एसी पांडे निदेशक ट्रेनिंग इंस्टीट्यूट एनआर लखनऊ से आग्रह करूंगी कि वे अंग वस्त्रम द्वारा प्रोफेसर साहब को सम्मानित करें डीजीसीओ श्री एम चंद्र दास से अनुग्रह करना चाहूंगी कि वे हम सब की ओर से प्रोफेसर साहब को एक स्मृति चिन्ह भेंट कर सम्मानित करें अब मैं स्वागत भाषण के लिए उप महानिदेशक महोदय को मंच पर आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगी लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी एंड टुडे आई एम प्रिविलेज टू वेलकम प्रोफेसर विनय कुमार श्रीवास्तव one of the most eminent anthropologist or so social anthropologist who has worked along with many tribes across length and breadth of india and has contributed immensely to the knowledge pool on this subject and he has gathered vast knowledge and he has produced a large number of publications books edited books and contributed also contributed as members of very important committees i think only just yesterday last morning he has landed in calcutta after visiting port blair after uh, attending some very important meeting over there so in gsi also from time to time we have come across different tribes in remote areas of the country and uh, many because that synergy is not there we fail to understand their sentiment we know very little about them while setting foot in their land so we get to know them better we must be able to appreciate their problems at least i we also welcome 
my colleague Sri M. Chandradas, the DYDG DGCO, Dr. Joyesh Bhakchi, Director, Ministry of Mines, my other esteemed, esteemed colleagues, and this August gathering. So, sir, on behalf of Geological Survey of India, on behalf of Geological Survey of India, I welcome you to enlighten us with some of your knowledge. Sir, please. So, good morning to all of you. Uh, my regards and my best wishes to all of you, respected Mukhopadhyay Sahib, respected Da Sahib, my distinguished colleagues and friends here, the young students the researchers, ladies and gentlemen. I am really lucky to be here and, and talking to you. I was just telling Mukhopadhyay Sahib that our office, that our office in Calcutta and your office where your Director General sits they're just diagonally opposite. And believe me, I did not know for many months that it was the Geological Survey of India office. I didn't know this. They also didn't know about, about us. But certain things happened which actually have brought me to this place, almost being inducted into your organization and also if we could be of any help, if anthropology could be any help to you, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take up. Let me begin in a descending order. It so happened that in the month of September last year, that there was a consultation which the Ministry of Mines organized with various institutions in connection with the draft of the National Mineral Policy. Your additional secretary, Dr. Rao, he happened to ring me up and he said if you could come and uh, speak to us about what you have to say in this connection. I avidly seized this opportunity. In fact, as a footnote, I'll tell you, wherever I get an opportunity, to bring in my discipline in perspective, I always go, so that you come to know what we do, what kind of expertise we have, and if it could be of any use to you, then we can have some collaborative sessions. So I went there, and again, this was my very good luck that I happened to be the first speaker. There were close to 70 to 80 people who were sitting in that hall. The meeting took place in Hotel Siddharth in Delhi. And I was the first one to speak. And the point which I made was that we should not forget tribal communities while we are carrying out geological research work, while we are carrying out geological exploration. And why tribes have to be kept in mind? Because the tribes are are in fact occupying those pieces of land, those vast tracts of land where a large number of mineral deposits are found. And I expanded on this. And I also told the honorable meeting that we should refrain from using the word indigenous for them. And I explained to them because number one, the government of India has not approved of the use of the word indigenous because this is a problematic concept. Who is indigenous and who is not indigenous? This is a real problem. And we will be able to establish the indigeneity 
the indigenousness of people provided we have we have evidence provided we have uh, we empirical ground historical and archaeological material to build it up till the time you know we should not use the words which may be a little problematic moreover i also reminded the august gathering there that the major mammoth project which was carried out by the anthropological survey of india under the under the director k s singh doc, director general uh, dr k s singh which was called people of india project it found that in india at that time there were 461 scheduled tribe and they said almost all tribal communities in india think that they have migrated to the present location from outside they they remember they the history or you can say the mythical history of their migration how they migrated from one part to the other and all this migration was triggered by the desire to be in an area where they would have sumptuous livelihood you know the whole theory of greener pasture so if the tribal themselves are thinking in terms of their migration their origin somewhere else in some cases the origin is not in the country some tribes believe that they came from baluchistan some tribes see, feel that they came from myanmar or from other places so there is a history of migration and therefore we should avoid the words like indigenous rather use the word which is used in the constitution of india scheduled tribes these were my submission and i was greatly delighted that when the minutes of uh, this this workshop came i occupied almost two and a half pages the whatever i said that was summarized there and i felt really elated and i was really elated when the draft of the national tribe national mineral policy came which was in the month of october that year the the <coughs> tribal and tribal's relationship with the mineral this occupied a large place and i thought that this is the first time that these people are being recognized for all these exploration now there are two other reasons apart from this that why i am so close to the to the discipline of geology i did my my bsc in anthropology and my msc in anthropology from delhi university and in the paper on archaeology there was substantial component on geological aspects especially the glacial the glacier age and uh, and different kinds of rocks when we look at the artifacts we also try to find out the rock of which they are made up the flaking and other thing and the third is that the department of geology in delhi university is contiguous to our department in fact at one time when i was a student some of you who are from delhi would would know this that uh, that uh, uh, um, these two subjects anthropology and geology they were the only ones under the rubric of science faculty which were not taught in any colleges they were not taught in any colleges so whether it was bsc or it was msc those days in geology the msc used to be of 3 3 years and it was called applied geology 3 years and there was no mphil and after the, th the 3 years of applied geology you could stay to start your your phd work so these two departments were together because they were not taught in uh, in 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 colleges and also uh, um, you know uh, geology was housed in a very small building where now stands the central science library of course now geology has its own uh, own building it is now the center of advanced study very close relationship between these two departments but these relations were not academic these relations were more social and um, and personal our friends were in, in, in geology in fact uh, the earlier head of the department chandrashekhar dubey is a very good uh, friend of mine almost contemporary so close relationship with these discipline and therefore i really feel honored to be here what i will do is that i will speak for maybe 45 minutes to an hour tell you about what we understand about the tribal communities and later on you know i would request you to ask me as many questions as possible mostly dealing with how to establish a dialogue 
with the tribal communities dialogue with the people whose lands you are going to explore so the relationship with these people how this has to be done and obviously if you want to establish any relationship with these people we should know who they are we should know what are their their characteristic first thing i would like to submit that and i personally think that every indian should know this i like to submit that the word tribe is a colonial term is a colonial construct this was used by the british to designate a set of people to designate communities of people who were largely isolated they were called tribal and those communities which had relationship with other communities communities which had relations with the with their neighbors and had relations of in, interact relations of interchange exchange relations they were called caste and that is why starting from the second half of the 19th century onward we find a large number of compendia which were published and these compendia were called tribes and castes in rajputana tribes and castes in deccan tribes and castes in madras presidency now these two terms were were used this was the first time you come across the society being dichotomized divided into two that these are the tribal people these are these are the castes and and often we ask is there any indigenous concept of tribe the term which is used in india for designating a community is jat or it is jati that's the term which is which is used and i would also like to submit that the word jat or jati used in a pan indian scenario it does not mean caste in fact the closest word to jati is it is a mode of classification it is a mode of taxonomy it is a mode of dividing category so the word jati is used for the entire human kind we have manav jati the word jati is used for gender purush jati istri jati the word is used even for demons and gods devata jati danav jati vanaspati jati no pashu jati you have you have so many contexts in which the word jati is used and the word jati is also used even for people who are not indian like angrez jati so the word is used more referring to a kind of classification that is why in our discipline we say that that jati is a polysemic term and by polysemic me we mean a word which has many meaning poly means many which has many meaning the same word conveying many meaning and one of the meanings of this is that it is referred for community i still remember that when i carried out my first field work as a student of bsc honors in anthropology it was way back in 1971 I remember we went to a village in Ranchi the village was called Kamde and it was in a place called Hehal in in Ranchi and I distinctly remember we asked people we said who are you and they said we are Orao jati we are Munda jati and the the confusion which came in our mind was how can they call themselves jati when they are tribal so they should say we are janajati or we are adivasi and then later on i realized that all these words like like ad adam jati the word adivasi the word vanna jati vanvasi all these words which are used in literature for these community they are our creation they are not their creation one of the important things which comes in uh, let me stand here one of the things which comes in our discipline is is that we have to be sensitive to two ways number one our way of understanding and their way of understanding themselves this distinction of we and they 
is something which is crucial crucial to us i mean say for example a simple question why did you study geology i can't provide you an answer the answer has to come from you so this is your perspective we often call it actor's point of view and the, and the technical word we use for this is emic e m i c the emic refers to your own way why this word is important because later on i'll say we have to find out what the tribes have to say about about themselves what is their understanding of themselves how they see their livelihood and their problem and in fact one of the questions which comes up is the kind of development we are we are planning for them is this the development they want or they want something else so we have to we have to go in their shoes we call it empathy that we have to understand it from their points of view and we have to just come out of any kinds of stereotype any kind of preconception which we may be carrying conception like oh well these people are illiterate they don't understand anything they are not close to our ways of understanding those kinds of things have to be completely discarded and we have to begin as an empathetic person knowing about the other knowing about the other in its context okay so so the question which came up in my mind was that these people are are calling themselves jati but they are not caste and later i realized that that jati was only referring to its own group its own community where people think they speak the same dialect they think they have the same ways of living they think they have same territory which they inhabit and also a sense of which is very important a sense of weness a sense of belongingness a sense of identification a sense of cooperation among among them and that was the reason why the former director general dr k s singh suggested that we should not use the word tribe or caste or janajati or jati rather we should call all these communities samudaya and samudaya means community people who identify themselves by the same name people who think they have the same characteristics people who think they have the same ways of uh, of of living and they have a sense of identification call them communities now these people the british call them tribal and versus caste and as you know and i will not go into into these thing because they are very well known and the papers have also been distributed you will be able to read all these thing that the list were prepared the list of the scheduled tribes scheduled castes this was prepared after the government of india act 1919 1935 and there were certain kinds of benefits which were made available to to them now over a period of time what has happened is that and this is an important question over a period of time we find that the number of these communities communities which are listed as scheduled tribe this has increased contemporarily there are 705 scheduled tribal communities and when k s singh was working on people of india project the volumes of which are very easily available there were 461 communities and over a length of time the number of the communities has increased and obviously the question which will come in your mind is that if today they are classified as a scheduled tribe what were they earlier what were they earlier and hence we have to make a distinction between two words one is tribe and the other is scheduled tribe tribe basically is an anthropological concept tribe means a community which is largely self sufficient a community which does not have many relations with the outside world a community which is largely insulated it doesn't mean totally totally isolated largely insulated and is a small community people do not have the tradition of reading and writing they are what is called preliterate we do not use the word illiterate or 
We do not use the word non-literate. We use the word pre-literate before literacy began, before the whole tradition of reading and writing came into existence. These people belong to this aid. And because these people have been largely isolated, they could not, you know, imbibe the characteristics of the outside world and they continued to be what they were over a length of time. And that is why you find the same ways of living going on. Perhaps the only community in the whole world which is till today uncontacted and the community about which we have absolutely no authentic knowledge apart from whatever we have been able to build up on the basis of our observation is the community of people who live in the island called Sentinel Island. You know about it because it was in, it was in news. Apart from Sentinel Islanders, whom we call Sentinelese, we do not know what they call themselves. We have no idea. All the other communities in the world, in one way or the other, have come in contact with the outside world and the contact has been in some cases very energizing and very active. In other cases, the contact has been little. Some communities are, are, are different from the other communities and therefore, these 705 scheduled tribal communities, they are, each one is different, each one is diverse, each one has its own ways of, of living. So, the concept of tribe, tribe is an anthropological concept defined principally in these characteristics. In fact, the BN Lokur committee identified five criteria according to which tribal communities are, are classified and one of the characteristics is that they have primitive trade, they have a distinct, distinctive culture, they are backward, you know, all those characteristics which are mentioned here. And scheduled tribe is principally an administrative category, is a constitutional category. Communities which have been set aside, communities, the list of which has been prepared principally for, for certain kinds of, you know, benefits which come under the policy of, of protective discrimination, preferential discrimination, and these are the community, and the communities have to apply for this. The state has to forward the request to the center, and then the process takes place, and with the presidential notification, a community is included in the scheduled tribe. Now, let us come to, come to the other two aspects, and they have a direct bearing, bearing on us. Aspect number one, these communities are distributed in all parts of the country. Now, I will confine largely to the tribal communities in, in India, all parts of the country. However, some states do not have any scheduled tribal population. For example, Haryana doesn't have, Punjab doesn't have, you know, uh, you don't find in, uh, in, in, in Pondicherry, Delhi also doesn't have any any scheduled tribe, but, but all these places which may not be having any scheduled tribe, there is a lot of migration. Have you ever, as a footnote I'll tell you, have you ever bothered to find that the lady who comes in your house to work, the person who drives your car, people who are in the tertiary occupations, the vendors, the hawkers, okay, the, uh, uh, the the destitute, from where have they come? You know the women who come to work in your house, just, I mean, we have to be sensitive. One thing which uh, social science teaches us is to be sensitive to the people around you. Just ask them and you will come to know that a large number of people who work in urban Delhi, who come and work in our houses, without whom our life is completely jeopardized. Do you know there's a whole folklore of, of uh, people's stories of uh, the problems they encounter while, while getting domestic help. I refrain from using any of the pejorative terms like maid. 
we are servants. We should not use these words because they are derogatory, they are pejorative. I personally think we should use the word domestic help. Now, if the domestic help does not come, your entire work is paralyzed. But who are these people who work for you? For paltry sum, paltry sum. I am often ached when I see people bargaining with the vegetable sellers. They are poor people. You know what is the state of vegetables now? How, how you know, cheap they are? In retail market, they become expensive. Look at the condition of these, these farmers. You have to, I mean, if you take a clue from the idea, you have to understand the other. The actor's point of view, you have to be sensitive to, uh, to them. And your own priorities should be examined in juxtaposition to their priorities. Now, this is the point which I want to put across. And how this has to be done, we need part particular kinds of ways of, of doing it to understand the tribal. If there is any purpose which this lecture would serve is to make one sensitive to the people around you who are as human as you are and who have all those problems and predicaments of life as you have. So you ask these, these domestic help and you'll come to know that a large number of them, I'm talking about the city of Delhi because I lived in Delhi for a very, very long time before moving to Calcutta. You'll find they all come from one or the other tribal areas. They come from Jharkhand, they come from Orissa, they come from Rajasthan, they come from Uttar Pradesh, they come from Andhra Pradesh. And, and the next question is, why have you come? And the kind of conditions in which they live in Delhi, they are so abominable that you can't think of being there, being there even for half a day. When my students used to go for field work in these areas, they often used to come back and telling me, oh my God, the stench was unbearable. But see, I, I would tell them, you were not able to bear the stench for two hours. And they live there for 24 hours. They are, they are there. They are smelling that kind of, 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 of a thing. The abominable conditions you know, in which they, they live. And if you start working out on this, one of my colleagues in Delhi University, in fact, started a work on, on the domestic help. You will come to know they are from one or the other tribal areas. Number two, you would come to know that they came because there was nothing available in their areas. They came because the land they occupied for years and years, the land which came to them from their ancestors, the land has been taken away for one or the other development projects. And they were not adequately compensated and they had no, no option but to come to the, to the cities. Now most of them were unskilled. In the sense, they knew about the traditional things which they were carrying out, but they were not skilled in the sense we are. And obviously, if one is not skilled, what one would do? One would take up the work which is at the lowest rung of the work hierarchy. So you will become a dishwasher, you will become a cleaner rather than a driver, because driver driving would require a particular kind of, kind of skill. And so they started very low with on a measly salary, measly salary. You know, you can imagine how difficult it would become. And then what happens is this inequality perpetuates over time. You look at the children playing at the construction site while their parents are working, carrying loads, carrying bricks. And you look at these children and if you're sensitive, you would say, you know, what will be the future of these children? They will be like their parents. Is there any social mobility, the kind of mobility of which we are a product? Many of you sitting here may have uh, come from very humble background, but we have moved up. And once we have moved up, our children will also be able to move up. 
so if they are not able to do which means they are to use a word from my discipline they are blocked spiralless meaning thereby their future is just blocked what will happen to these children who are not able to go to the school what will be the future of these children who have no skills except the skills of uh, carrying bricks and uh, plaster that's all so so why this kind of a condition has come into existence primarily because their land has been alienated why land has been alienated go back further it has been alienated because one or the other development project for what is called eminent domain which means public interest in the domain of of for all one or the other project needed the land which they had been inhabiting they had to vacate it and so where would they go the land given to them number 1 was unproductive and so there was no point in moving there number 2 it was far off number 3 number 3 the same community was given land at different places so the community was uh, bifurcated trifurcated some people went here some people went there some people went to the other place now the sense of community was was lost therefore where would you come down eventually you will come down to the fact that you will start migrating to the city and our cities are swelling like anything you there's something you know in urban um, studies and i'm sure in um, in geography we do urban um, urban studies and also urban geography we speak of what is called metropolitanization and metropolitanization is regarded as the stage after urbanization and we say that this is where metropolitanization is one where the things almost come to a stop with reference to increase in population it becomes almost stable because people in the urban area they have fewer children in fact you have a large number of families where where uh, the couple doesn't want to have any children they are called a childless couple they are childless not because of any biological reason but because they don't want they don't want to have and you have a large number of families in urban areas which have single child so population starts stabilizing migration doesn't occur much except for the international migration which may occur that kind of a thing is yet to come in uh, in indian cities why because a large number of people are migrating and one of the aspects of this kind of a displacement is large migration as social scientists we say we should not miss out three aspects in any analysis number 1 the aspect of gender for a very long time we have been thinking that society has one point of view but now we say not at all not at all gender is a very important factor please don't think the way the men think is similar to the way women think so gender component has to come so the impact of displacement is different you know on men is different on on women and in fact women have suffered the maximum because of this kind of a of of a displacement you know small thing small thing like you know like like settlements which do not have any toilets women have to move for several meters you know to look for a place where they can use it as for for their fancying the call of nature and you know it has been found time and again that a large number of sex related crime happen there you have not to conduct a survey for this you just read you know the newspaper reports the women's work has multiplied several fold bringing water for example so first is gender which we have not to miss out the second one is that you have to see in terms of age longevity has increased 
You know, there's a very famous statement which comes in medical anthropology, and I like it. Modern medicine has increased longevity, but has not decreased pain. Has not decreased pain. Longevity has increased. You know, my brother who is a doctor, he says that you bring a sick to the hospital, we will not allow him to die. But what kind of a quality of life will people have? Longevity is increasing. It is increasing especially for the upper classes, the upper middle classes, may not be so for the lower classes. And age is the second variable. Impact on people who are from the from the 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 old age group is different from those who are from the young age group. Keep in mind the aspect of age and look at the impact of all these changes which occur in terms of age. And the third is once you know we never bothered about these things. And I will give you a couple of examples is disability. Third thing is disability. Whenever we carry out any exploration, any kind of a survey, keep in mind that there are always in every community people who are disabled. And what will happen to these disabled? You know what was the pattern in hunting and food gathering societies? In hunting and food gathering societies, if the child was disabled, the child was allowed to languish to death is a Darwinian solution you could say because such a child who is born disabled will not be able to hunt will not be able to go for food gathering so it is better for the child to 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 die because these communities required a different kind of a physique a different kind of a of, of, of a body but but with the coming of modern medicine things have improved disabled people are able to able to live and so so we have not to miss out the element of disability in my field we have anthropology of children and we also have anthropology of disability so in any kind of a study we carry out we have to keep in mind gender, we have to keep in mind age, we have to keep in mind mind the, the disabled people. Earlier we never bothered and that is why social sciences, even sciences, not just social sciences, they were accused of being androcentric, the word which means male-centered. Everything is being seen from the point of view of the of the male and females were simply extraneous to this kind of a of a discourse. If we keep these things in mind, our our understanding becomes very different. In the last hundred years or so, maybe more than hundred years, what has happened is that the tribals have been have been looked at by two kinds of people. Number one, those who wanted to administer them. And number two, those who wanted their resources to be siphoned away. Resources to be siphoned away. Those who wanted to administer the administration. And the second is the, those who had some kind of a of an economy. You know, mining began sometimes in the late 18th century, 1774 or, or, or so. And then you find that uh, coal, coal fields they were all opened up. And where were they happening? They were happening in all the tribal areas. And obviously people were shifted out from, from there. And this has gone on and on with the result that today, if you bring